Are you ready to study Luke chapter 12, continuing education? <clears throat> um, we're going to, like I just did this sermon a few minutes ago, and I can't guarantee it'll be the same. I probably have two pages of notes, which I never have that. So it's likely we'll get some of the same stuff, but we'll just see what God's going to do, all right? You give me permission to just be me. At least three people do. Okay, so I'm going to preach for those three people. All right. <clears throat> We're in Luke chapter 12, and we're starting in verse 41, but uh, what we're going to refer to lots is last week. Last week, we talked about Jesus coming, the return of Jesus, saying the master's coming, and, and he tells them all these things to do, and then today, Peter asks a question, and we're going to talk about his answer to that question. So uh, I'm going to refer a lot to last week's sermon, but we're going to just read this week's verses. Chapter 12, verse 40. If I can find it. <clears throat> Why can't I find it? Because the lights have it completely blank. Oh, there, read the screen. Oh, there you go. Thank you. <clears throat> Verse 41. So Peter said, Lord, are you addressing this parable to us or to everyone else as well? And the Lord said, who then is the faithful and sensible steward whom his master will put in charge of his servants, servants to give them their rations at the proper time? Blessed is that slave whom his master finds so doing when he comes. Truly, I say to you that he will put him in charge of all of his possessions. But if that slave says in his heart, my master will be a long time coming and begins to beat the slaves, both men and women, and to eat and drink and get drunk, oh my, the master of that slave will come on a day when he does not expect him, and in an hour he does not know, and will cut him to pieces, in pieces, and assign him a place with the unbelievers. <laughs> and that slave who knew his master's will and did not get ready or act in accordance with his will will receive many lashes. I mean, I mean, wow. But the one who did not know it and committed deeds worthy of a flogging will receive but few. From everyone, from everyone who has been given much, much will be required. From everyone. And to whom they've entrusted much, of him they will ask all the more. I mean, uh, cut him to pieces. <laughs> And flog him with many lashes. And the guy, the other guy, he gets less. And I'm just like, what we want to do is look at this, this, this question Peter asks. Lord, are you addressing this parable to us or to everyone else as well? And I, all of this stuff he says is Peter asking, are you addressing this parable to us? And the parable is about the thief coming in the night. The parable is about the return of the Lord and the person not being ready. Now, he's been talking to the lawyers. He was talking to the Pharisees, and he addressed them, and it was miserably hard what he said to them because they've been chosen, and they've been called, and they have a position. They've taken on, by their own choice even, a position of great responsibility. And he tore them to shreds for chapters. And then it says he turned and addressed his disciples. Now, I've been saying this for weeks and asking you, who's he talking to? His disciples. And right at the end of this parable, Peter says, who are you talking to? Now, Luke is the one that told us he's talking to his disciples. He didn't say, okay, now I'm addressing my disciples. And Peter, they all knew that he turned from those lawyers and Pharisees to them to say, now you, now that I've said this to them, now listen to this for you. Because they didn't really realize what he was putting them in charge of. They didn't really realize what they were being called to. Neither did I when I was called. Neither does almost anyone when they're called. There would be no pastors on earth if we all knew what we were getting into. It's a trap, man. <clears throat> but it's a wonderful trap. I have no complaints about it. But I wouldn't have done it if you told me what it was going to be like. And that's true about just about everything. Can I do a youth ministry? I want to do a youth ministry. Yeah, that'd be great. And then you go into it and you go, oh, my gosh, what was I thinking? Just don't, you know, keep it, keep it like 
don't tell anybody. But Jesus turns to them and he says, you, to the answer, who are you talking to? Who then is the sensible and faithful servant? Who is the one who took what he was given, took what he was called to, and, and, and did something with it? <clears throat> and so the question you have to ask yourself is, are you his disciple? And are you someone that has received something from the Lord? And are you doing something with it? Good. If you are, then he's addressing you. He's telling you that there is a great deal of responsibility with it. And in the end, he even says, the one who knew and didn't do anything received many lashes and was cut into pieces. I mean, it's like, it's like, ah! And the one who didn't know, he, was, he still got lashes, but he just got less. And so you, what, what that means is that to say you know, I am a Christian, gives you more responsibility. Now for me, I, don't, I, I go right back to March 10th, 1975, right down, back to that day. I got to know that he's real. I went forward in a 20-second prayer, and when I walked out, I knew he's real. I never knew that before. But why me? Why do I get to know he's real? And it's kind of like, oh, wow, I'm privileged or something. But when you read these scriptures, it says, yes, you're privileged because you got to know. But you are also responsible because you say, I know. Wow. You are also, I've been called. Well, why me? Why do I get to have access to the wisdom of God? Why do I get to do the things I do? Yes, you're privileged, but you are also now responsible. What did you do with what you were given? I have many times in my life, like I talked last week, for those of you that were last week, were here last week or heard the sermon last week, I've had a great deal of possession placed on me. And it's what he's saying. Who is then the faithful steward, sensible and faithful steward of the things you've been given? Well, if I had been given nothing, you just say, you haven't been given what I've been given. But I know one thing that all of us can be given, and that's the knowledge that God is real. We also can also, I have found, that you can have the knowledge that you've been forgiven. And so just that alone causes you to be somebody who's received something that is going to be scrutinized. What did you do with your understanding of that cross? I grew up in a church where the cross had Jesus on it. Most of you grew up in a church where Jesus was not on the cross. What did you do with your knowledge of the cross? You knew he was on the cross. You knew he wa why he was on the cross. And you knew that it was for you. What did you do with that knowledge? He forgave you. Read the, uh, in Matthew 18, the story of the wicked manager. He says, should you, it was about a guy who was forgiven a great amount, but refused to forgive somebody else. And the guy who forgave him the great amount came back and said, shouldn't you, since I forgave you, shouldn't you have forgiven him? It's like, you've been given this great forgiveness. What did you do with it? Now, that's what today's story is about, but it's referring back to Peter's question. What he said, what I read last week. And what he said last week was, who, this week is, who then is the sensible servant? Who, who, who handles, the, who stewards what he's been given by God? I mean, he manages, he applies, he does something with what God gave him. And what he just told them was, it's the person who seeks God's kingdom first. He told them it's those who are not afraid that they will suddenly be left without food. Because remember he said, he talked about the lilies of the field and the ravens of the sky. That if he takes care of them, won't he take care of you? So he's the, do, and he said, do not be afraid, you are worth more. And so he's saying it's the one who seeks his kingdom. It's the one who's not afraid to be alone. The one who's not afraid to be broke. The one who's not afraid he won't be taken care of. This is the sensible servant that Jesus is talking to. This is the one who takes what he was given. See, the understanding that God is your father, and if you who are evil know how to give your son bread if he asks for it, your father in heaven would give you bread if you asked for it, or good things, the Holy Spirit if you asked for it. And so it's all about this 
what do you do with what you've been given? Do you know that you have a father in heaven? Do you know that he would take care of you and feed you? Then you have no reason to be afraid. And what he's saying is, who are you talking to? Who then is the sensible, good servant, faithful servant? The one who seeks the kingdom first and the one who is not afraid. The one who stores up his treasure in heaven, not in warehouses, because that was the parable of last week, the guy who built warehouses two weeks ago. <clears throat> the guy who does not store up in heaven, but stores up treasure in heaven. I mean, does not store up on earth, but stores up in heaven. And then this, uh, the one who is dressed in readiness, who is looking for the coming of the Lord. This is the sensible servant, the sensible steward, the one who's at work in his, in his master's house. It's the one who is waiting for their master. It's the one who, whose lamp is lit and has oil in his lamp. This is all in one section of scripture that I'm referring to from last week. It is the one who opens the door to Jesus when he knocks. It is the one that's on the alert at all times and readiness. And, and he, says, he says this about those in today's verses. He says, blessed are those slaves. It's about whether or not you're a slave. Are you a slave to Jesus Christ? It's popular today to say I'm a blood-bought child of God or I'm a son. You don't hear me saying I'm a son all the time. What you will hear me saying all the time is I'm a slave. I'm a bond servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. If he calls me son, then I'm a son. If I call me a son, doesn't mean I'm a son. You'll hear me all the time talk about him as my father. But you won't talk about me, hear me talk about me being a son. I will trust him as a father, as a slave. I will trust him as a father, as a bondservant. And it's him who does again, seeks first the kingdom, is not afraid, has, stores up his treasures in heaven, is dressed in readiness, is waiting for him eagerly, which I am waiting for him daily. And my lamp is lit, oil is in my lamp and I keep it full. I open the door when Jesus calls. I open the door to whatever he wants open. And I'm on the alert at all times against my enemy. And, when the, and this is who the faithful servant is that he talks about in verse 42. In verse 43, he says, the master will put them in charge of all of his servants. And so the person who handles right what God has given them, puts on the breastplate of righteousness, wears the helmet of salvation, carries his shield of faith faithfully, bears the sword of the spirit and walks in the world as though He's here to win the damsel in distress, rescue the lost and the poor and the, those that can't rescue themselves. This is the faithful servant he's talking about. The one who bears the armor of God, wears Jesus on himself as a, as a body of armor. This is the one. The ble- and, and he says this, that servant, he says, blessed is that slave. Are you a slave? Do you accept being a slave to Jesus Christ? It's a, it's a negative term in today's world, being a slave. But that's what Paul said. Paul was a man who on a mission. From the time he was born, his days were planned. His name was Saul. He was from a city called Tarsus. And his father bought him a Roman citizenship to climb the ladder. To climb the ladder, man. He was going to be the best of the best. He was going to be the famous. He was going to have it all. He was so zealous for what he was, he went to the Stanford University of his day to be educated in, in the religious studies of the Torah, of the, of the Old Testament. He was going to be a Pharisee of Pharisees, a priest of priests, even so that he killed men to protect his religion. And Jesus interrupted that on the road to Damascus. And every letter he wrote after that, he said, Paul. His name was changed to Paul by Jesus, a bondservant of Jesus Christ. By definition, bondservant is someone who is sold into slavery. He said, I was sold into slavery by Jesus. I was bought with a price. And he considered himself a slave all the days of his life. Do you consider yourself a slave? For me, Paul's the greatest Christian man I've ever heard of. I read his words and I call them God's word to me. Peter, he started out a fisherman. He also writes about his slavery to Jesus Christ. 
He also describes himself as a servant bought with a price. His life is no longer his own. Also, one of the greatest Christian men of all time, Peter. We've all read of his failures. We've all read of him sinking. But we sometimes forget to sink, you got to be out there first. He walked on water before he sank. Great Christian man. Failed miserably around a campfire, but later proclaimed him and, uh, and asked to be crucified upside down. I'm not sure I'd be worried about how I was crucified when I'm about to be crucified, but he was. <clears throat> he fit all of these categories, seeking the kingdom first, not afraid that God wouldn't take care of him. Stored up his treasures in heaven. He was dressed in readiness, waiting for his master. His lamp was lit. He opened the door. He did all of these things. He was on the alert at all times for the kingdom of heaven and for the glory of God. And he turns to Jesus and asks this crazy question. Who are you talking to? The faithful servant, the one that hears me. He's the one I'm talking to. I'm warning him that if you get to know me, if you get to receive me, if you get to be forgiven, you do something with it. You carry it faithfully. You possess it well. You demonstrate it correctly. You don't become perverse. You don't become immoral. You don't become a sinner. You quit being a sinner. You don't become unrighteous. You become righteous. And you carry it correctly. Because the one who gets this gift of knowing me, being forgiven by me, and then doesn't carry it right, he's going to be cut to pieces in many lashes. He gads. The one, you're better off if you'd have never received it in the first place because that guy's going to get less lashes. Let's just take those two subjects and like, I don't want to be that. What I want to be is that sensible, faithful steward of all that God gives me. <clears throat> I don't want it to seduce me. I don't want it to control me. The fear of being alone. You know, I have people that, their fear of being alone, they walk away from Christianity. People who are pastors walking away from Christianity. A fear of being alone. Fear of impoverishedness, poverty. A fear of homelessness or a fear of, he won't take care of me. And that's what he's talking about. You knew me, he says, and you didn't think I would take care of you? You never knew me at all. You said you were forgiven, but you wouldn't forgive? You're not forgiven at all. In fact, the apostle told us when they do that, they were never with us in the first place. That's what it says. That's what those men I just described, that's what they say. If you, if you didn't trust, if you, didn't, if you knew him and didn't trust him, then you didn't know him. If you were afraid of being alone when the God of heaven makes his home in you, and you thought you were alone, then you didn't know him, and he wasn't in you. That's what they say. And that's what Jesus is talking about in these verses today. That we would be ready for him. And being ready for him is that we recognize that he's in us, that what we have. I went forward at this concert. I, I had no intention. I hated people. I hated Christians. I was mad at his church. I didn't want anything to do with Jesus. And I went forward. And I can tell you that I must have had some belief, but as far as I knew, I had no belief. And I decided to take this guy up on the challenge and pray his silly little prayer. I showed him. And I found out one thing. I actually found out too. I ran outside. I was so shocked. I still didn't like Christians. That didn't change at the altar. I wanted to get out of that room of Christians faster than anything ever that day, back in 1975. But I went out of there and said, whoa, he's real. Right. Number one, he's real. What am I going to do with that? That means everything I heard as a kid is probably true. That means all this stuff is true. Uh-oh. There probably is a heaven, and if there's a heaven, there's probably beatings, torn to pieces, shreddings, all that stuff, he says. Fire, where the worm never dies, and all the things I'd heard, you know, oh my gosh, that might be true too. I found out he was real, 
And you know what else I found out in that room that night? He didn't reject me. I would have rejected me. He should have rejected me. He didn't reject me. He was real. He didn't reject me. We like to say I got saved that night, but I'm not sure I did. What I found out that night was I found out he was real. I found out, I found out he wanted me. And I knew I wanted him. My goodness. He forgave me. I went in there like a man carrying a 200-pound pack, man. And I walked out of there like, where did it go? What happened? How, how does this work? Right. What happened? I looked at a magnolia tree, and I realized the world's a different place. I've, seen, I've been around magnolia trees all my life, and they've never looked like that. How could I have not seen what a magnolia tree looks like until now? Wow. Something's changed. Something's different. Oh, no. And I knew. I'm in this for life. I've never, I've never gone backwards. I've never stepped. I'm ready. The door's open. He knocks. It's open. I'm ready. Are you ready? What's this say? What, how about you? Do you know he's real? Do you know he loves you and forgives you? If you seek him, you'll find him. Do you know he wants you? Some of you know this is kind of hard to believe. He won't reject you. I'm serious. As bad as you think you are, he won't reject you. He hasn't yet, anyway. I haven't met anyone yet that he's rejected. And he, I'm reasonably sure he won't reject you. I mean, that's like, okay, I've been called to pastor. Maybe I shouldn't have been. <laughs> I don't know, but he, that was his choice. I've been called and given charge over many servants. I've been given responsibility for great amounts. He's placed possessions in my hand more than most people in a lifetime, and I've had many lifetimes of possessions in my hands. And he's trusted me with them. They were his when he gave them to me. They're his while I had them, and they're his after I let them go. Because I'm ready for the coming. And blessed is that servant that is ready. Are you ready? I told last week about a youth group where I told him he's coming back before next Wednesday. And they flipped their lids, freaking out, crying, wailing, oh no, I'm not ready. Are you ready? Are you ready? Who's he talking to? The whole thing is about the question, who are you talking to? I'm talking to the one that's ready. Be ready. You say, well, I have no responsibilities. Yes, you do. There are people all around you. There's a whole world of people that don't get to know he's real. And if you're in this room today and you believe that you know he's real, you believe that he's real, then you've already been given a gift right. so big so incredible that not everyone gets. You get to know God is real. You should know he hasn't rejected you. But what you might not know is the responsibility that comes with saying, I know God. The punishment to him who says I know but doesn't do anything with it. The punishment to him who says I know but doesn't then use it for others. Go and give it away. Help other people know he's real. Help other people know that they're not rejected. Help other people know they can be forgiven. That their father in heaven loves them and, and made a way for them to come back. The old four spiritual laws. There's man and God is separated and through Jesus there's a bridge. Jesus came that we can have a father in heaven. He came to, to reunite us to the father. I mean, they don't, need, they don't know that. And if you do, then you've been given a responsibility right. to be the sensible, good servant. Woe to that slave who knew but did not do. That's what it says in here. That's what he, I just read to you. Do you know? Then you have a responsibility. You have a, a gift so big to demonstrate to the world the love of God. And the love of God, for this is how we know he loves us. He sent Jesus to die on a cross. And this is the love of the Father that he sent Jesus to die on a cross. And for God so loved the world, he 
gave his only begotten son. He just says it over and over and over in different ways. This is how God loves us. He's real, makes himself available to you. He won't reject you. And if you know that, you've got the responsibility of the world on your shoulders. What will you do with it? He will carry you. He will walk with you. He will teach you. He will love you and forgive you over and over and over. But we need to be seekers of the kingdom first who aren't afraid that he won't take care of us. If we say we know him, we must say, I know then that he will take care of me because I know him. I am not afraid. My treasures are in heaven, not on earth. I don't need to build warehouses. We can tear the warehouses down. I don't need them. I have a father in heaven who will take care of me. I am dressed in readiness. I'm dressed in the armor of God, in the breastplate, wearing the helmet, the equipment, the shoes. I got the whole nine yards. I'm wearing the, carrying my shield and I'm wielding my sword because I know he's real and I know he's forgiven me and he's with me. He has not rejected me and I will not reject him. And blessed is that slave who was on the alert opening the door to Jesus. He's coming back, people. He might come back for me before you, but he's coming back. One day he will come for us all, but he's coming back. And I don't want to see you left behind. He's coming back. And who he's talking to is anybody who's been given from God. The revelation, last week some of you found out he was real in a swimming pool. Some of you find out he's real during the worship services. Some of you have all kinds of evidences. And he's saying to you, if you know he's real, if you have been given this responsibility of having him revealed to you, what will you do with it? Are you ready? Are you ready to give your life? My life is not my own, Paul said. My life is not my own, Peter said. I'm a bondservant of the Lord Jesus Christ. I am his slave. him as my father. He takes care of me. I know him. He is good. Come hell or high water, he's good. The world might not be good. People might not be good. Institutions might not be good. Religions might not be good. He is good. And he is with me. And he is with you. Will you seek him and find him? If you don't know him, you can meet him today. If you don't know he's real, you can find out today. But let's bow our heads. Let's close our eyes. Let's seek the Lord and see what he has for us. Mighty God. Thank you, Lord. We just let him touch you. Holy Spirit, we ask for a greater level of your anointing, your blessing, your grace, your truth, greater revelation that you're real, that you have not rejected us, a greater revelation of your acceptance of us. If you want that, a revelation that he has accepted you, forgiven you, he's not mad at you, if he's not mad at you, you need to know it. If he is mad at you, you need to know it. Seek him. Be forgiven. And he won't be mad at you anymore. Are you hearing me? Keep your eyes closed, your heads bowed. Let the Holy Spirit speak to you. Jesus. Love you, Jesus. I am yours. You are mine. I love you, Lord. want to know him, I suggest you come to the altar and seek him. If you want to just be forgiven, things you've been doing, if you just want to remember that he loves you, I say move from where you are. Change your location. Bow before him. Confess. You just 
just want to be recommitted to your purpose in life, recommitted to your calling, recommitted to what he has given you, making it something you work with, something you do put into play, storing up your treasures in heaven, then come to the altar, turn around in your seat, move to another aisle, just move from where you at and move towards the Lord, from where you're at and move towards the Lord receive his mercy and grace. Seek him and find him. Open the door when he's knocking. He'll knock today. We'll have pastors come forward. You want to you give your life to Jesus, look for one of these pastors. They'll identify themselves. They'll be looking around for you. They'll be up here in the front, though. Jesus, thank you. We love you. We will worship the Lord. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. Ask your Holy Spirit to move, move amongst us. Bring conviction to those that need conviction, commitment to those that need commitment. Change in theology, repentance, and wrong thinking, whatever it is, Lord, bring conviction and whisper in our hearts. Let us know that you are real, that you have not rejected us, you have not failed me in these 47 years, and I want to not fail you. Let's go further up and farther in, Jesus. Further up and farther in. Every day, me and you. I'm with you, Jesus. Here I am. I love you, Lord. Pray, Jesus, I open my heart to you. I give you my life. I ask you to forgive me of my sins. Pray that. Seek him and find him. Open the door to him. He's knocking. He said in Revelation, he's knocking. Open the door. I will come in and have fellowship with you. Who knows, even a magnolia tree could look different. Let it change you. Accept the responsibility of what he gives you and use it. Put it to work. Store up your treasure in heaven. Put it to, put it to use. Hallelujah, Lord. Get your money moving in the kingdom. That's moving in the kingdom. All I have inside. Hallelujah. Heart, soul, and mind. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He's not going to run out. If you knew him, you'd know that. For the cross you Hallelujah. Every nail and watching the Father's House Orville YouTube channel, but don't stop there. We'd love you to subscribe to our channel so that you never miss a live service or a video. Help us spread the message of Jesus by sharing this video with your friends. You can also support the Father's House financially by clicking the give button. Thanks again for watching today and we hope to see you again soon.